Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin with the Mises Institute. And with me today is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And it's the day after Election Day 2024. And I went to bed at the usual time last night because it seemed pretty well wrapped up by, uh, I don't know, 10, 30, 11 here in Colorado. Uh, so I was expecting to wake up to a Trump win, and I did. There weren't any surprises. They didn't find a 100,000 Democratic votes in Pennsylvania at 3 a.m. Uh, but I, I think that was a little bit uh, uh, credited to the fact that people were watching for it. <laughs> and after years and years of people saying they're going to cheat, it's a little harder to cheat. So there were uh, there were a lot of those those issues just surrounding the whole thing. I wasn't going to bet. Uh, a whole lot of money on the outcome at all, but it came out, Trump won. Uh, people who were really invested in it were very happy. Lots of uh, people on the left freaking out, sobbing and social media and so on. Uh, but we're gonna talk today about the, the grim reality moving forward of geopolitics, of uh, federal spending, of the federal debt, those sorts of issues, which Trump doesn't really have a solution for any of these things at all. And he's going to have to deal with that as well as the, the PR disasters that are waiting for him in terms of the economy and related issues. Uh, but first, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, you can get daily emails from the Mises Institute uh, if you just go to the site and subscribe. We, we haven't been really mentioning that at all lately, but... Uh, if you would like daily updates or weekly, you can you can choose either. You don't have to get a daily email. You get a weekly email. Uh, go to mises.org, and at the top, you can just click on subscribe. Uh, and if you're really motivated, you can always become a member of the Mises Institute, and you can just click on donate uh, on the site as well to do that. And then you'll get uh, our physical magazine that comes out every other month. Um, and uh, we'll, of course, invite you to all of our events, and there's some other benefits as well. Uh, speaking of events, though, we have one coming up very soon, which I guess I think we'll have to mention the last time here. Yeah, coming up this weekend, we've got an exciting event down in beautiful Fort Myers, Florida, uh, talking about elections and the economy. Do they really matter? We've got a great lineup with Mises Institute President Tom DeLorenzo, Dr. Mark Thornton, Wanjira Najoya, and our good friend Murray Sabrin. Um, again, that's going to be this weekend in Fort Myers. There are still a few seats available that they're going fast. You can find that at Mises.org slash events. And as we take a peek to uh, 2025, uh, also down in, uh, I guess it's a more, more central Florida, but still down that way, is uh, we're, we have an exciting event in Tampa in February uh, about educating for liberty and looking at uh, breaking away from the government school industrial complex down there. So particularly if you're in the Florida area, but always makes for a good destination uh, dynamic as well. You can find those events and many, many more. We are building out our 2025 calendar right now. You can find all those at Mises.org slash events. All right. Well, uh, what does Trump do now? Uh, a lot of the focus, of course, this has always been the issue, right? Is uh, most of the commentary on this is related to social issues and stuff where there's a clear moral position in many cases. And, hey, Trump should uh, – <laughs> he should be against federal funding for uh, transsexual operations for uh, the residents of federal prisons. Okay, great. Um, oh, Trump should be against handing over thousands of dollars in rooms and luxury hotels to illegal immigrants. All right. Easy. This, that's the easy stuff. The, the tougher stuff comes in when we start talking about things like, oh, the, <laughs> the federal debt that is barreling toward $40 trillion. And Trump has no plan for how to deal with this. And you can see this in the um, the yields that continue to go up. This is something that hasn't been mentioned very much. If you just want a sense of how bad the debt situation is poised to be and what investors are expecting from the economy, uh, we can look at, at yields. And we can see that the yield curve is steepening. That is that the longer term yields are going up faster 
And so 10 year, the 30 year, that, that has been going up. And so in spite of the Fed forcing down the federal funds rate uh, in September, and we were supposed to believe, oh, man, uh, interest rates are now going to go down because the Fed is intervening to push down interest rates. That hasn't actually happened. Longer term interest rates have gone up. Mortgage rates have gone up. This isn't supposed to happen when the Fed reduces interest rates. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that bond investors expect more inflation. It tells us that they do not have confidence. I mean, there are other reasons involved too, but it tells us that they do not have confidence that uh, the Fed has, has, has slain the inflation dragon and that there's a serious risk of stagnation uh, or stagflation coming in the economy in the near future. And I think a lot of these investors are right. Uh, it's right to, to expect that to happen. And I think that's a big reason that we're seeing uh, the yield curve steepening. We're seeing the longer term yields go up, which means prices of bonds are going down. And this also means, of course, just in a very practical sense, that the Fed doesn't really have control over the bond markets like it may wish to have. And so that there's a lot of investors out there who aren't simply following the rules. They're not doing what the Fed wants them to do. And uh, debt's going to get very, very expensive. And this is going to translate into big problems for the federal government. If you're Donald Trump and you want to just keep spending endlessly, which is apparently his plan, he's going to move around the spending, of course, less money to, um, to Ukraine, maybe more money to the state of Israel. Uh, or maybe even just spend it domestically. But there's no plans to cut anything. We're looking at a $2 trillion deficit just this past year, and which is huge, by the way. I mean, a, a trillion dollar deficit in peacetime was considered outlandish uh, really before Trump. And then he kind of ushered in the idea of the trillion dollar peacetime deficit. And then, of course, all bets were off when COVID happened. And then it's just gone out of control. 1.5, 1.6, two trillion dollar deficits per year, just adding more and more to that. Well, you have to pay interest on all of that. And the hope is, is that the Fed can force all that down and make it more affordable to pay that interest. But the bond markets are suggesting that mm, that's that's not happening the way the Fed wants it to. So there's a lot of turmoil out there in the markets. We're all supposed to look at the fact that the stock market went way, way up today. Uh, apparently exuberant that, that Trump was elected. But stock markets go up when inflation is expected. Stock markets go up when there's a lot of monetary inflation. So this doesn't really tell us much of anything. And then we can expect a weakening economy when we look at the job situation. So looking at all of this, I'm just really curious as to what Trump is going to do to explain why the U.S. is having all these economic problems after he got elected. Now, you know, though, and I know that these economic problems go way back and have deep roots in other issues that are hardly related to whatever Trump did the day before yesterday. But the public doesn't seem to understand that. So uh, it seems that the Trump administration really is going to have their work cut out for them. Yeah, I mean, Trump is inheriting a very different world than he did in 2016 for all the problems that 2016 had, and plenty of them there, obviously. Is that again? You know, as you mentioned, particularly you know, again, the the, the inflationary consequences, the the limitation. You know, we we don't have the same sort of uh, wiggle room. Um, you know, perhaps that's a good thing in the long run because maybe that'll get us closer to uh, uh, getting to the points where uh, some some of the very difficult decisions will be forced upon politicians because they don't tend to act proactively on the situation. So it will be very difficult um, for uh, you know, he's in, he's in, inheriting a very difficult hand. And the other side of it is just, you know, the way that the entire process is stacked against any sort of significant change, right? So for all of the, all the rhetoric that we saw at times, uh, you know, the campaign about, oh, well, you know, we're going to bring in Elon Musk and he's going to create government efficiency and things like the, things like that, which, hey, you look, more power to him. Hopefully, you know, hopefully they can find a cutting a penny here, cutting a penny there. But, you know, even if you look back at the first term, um, you know, some of Trump's proposed budgets, right? Because you know, presidents propose these budgets. They're always kind of fantasy documents, right? You know, they're, they're basically fan fiction coming from the executive branch. Um, you know, there were some modest cuts proposed from time to time, depending on the year. Um, I wrote some articles um, uh, back then, you know, particularly some, some cuts on kind of 
uh, science and research, which have had, I think, a positive impact on kind of depoliticizing that and, and this, that, and the other. So even even some of these these you know, fantasy documents that um, these proposals that were you know, did come out of the the first Trump White House. So that, as soon as you get to Congress, right, their appetite is always for more spending, always for more pork for their district, um, and. Again, there's no reason to expect that to change in any meaningful way. It does look like they're going to have a trifecta with the House and the Senate, all things uh, trending as they are right now. Uh, but again, you know, as, as we've seen in the past, and as, as you've documented quite well, uh, you know, usually there is no more uh, spinthrift government quite like a, uh, a unified Republican Congress. Maybe the first two years of the Biden administration a couple of years ago gave that uh, uh, you know, it was, it was a historical anomaly there with uh, some of the runaway uh, spending bills that we got uh, in the aftermath of the, of the COVID situation. But again, we've seen in the past that you know, re when Republicans are in charge, there is absolutely no appetite for any sort of reduction in spending. And given the much larger issues, you know, interest on debt payments, things like that, um, you know, this is a, a far more difficult world that um, again, politics as usual when it comes to ignoring these dynamics and being able to get away with it, um, it doesn't matter who is in charge of the White House without any sort of significant radical reform, um, which again, politics is not meant, you know, Washington is not built for that no matter who wins. Um, you know, these are very real situations. And of course, we can already expect that, you know, particularly given the media what they are, you know, every, every, every bad thing that's going to happen in the next four years economically is going to be blamed on some sort of caricature of, uh, you know, Trump as the embodiment of you know, pure capitalism, the same way that, you know, the, the ghost of Reagan is still used as sort of the, the embodiment of, you know, neoliberalism and, you know, deregulation gone, gone, gone awry and things like that. Um, you know, we know exactly how the media is going to play it out. We know exactly how um, the left is going to characterize it. And so it'll be very interesting to see, um, you know, exactly what, uh, to, to the extent there are any plans outside of tariffs, um, you know, is there any way to translate the political capital that, you know, I think particularly a popular vote dynamic you know, legislatively, you know, legally has no very, uh, you know, no bearing on who controls the power, but there is a, a political capital element of it. You know, is, is Trump willing to invest that in something that resembles, uh, you know, abolishing the Department of Education, which he campaigned a lot about, right? Is, is, is that where he's going to put his priorities or is he going to spend that capital in other areas? And again, given, you know, what we've seen in for, from Trump in the past, I think there's some, some pretty good reasons that his top priority getting the office is not going to be fulfilling some of the, the difficult issues that um, America finds itself in, but perhaps more of the, uh, the superficial ones. Yeah, I mean, I think there are good things that the administration can do. Uh, anything that clips the wings of the CIA and the FBI and the deep state and uh, appointing some good judges who aren't horrific, uh, this is all to the good. If, if the U.S. Supreme Court can con continue on its current tear of overturning things like the Chevron decision and things like that, that's all great. It's all good. However, in, in the end, come 2028, if the economy's in shambles and the U.S. is on the verge of a, um, uh, a sovereign debt crisis, well, that has long, longer-term historical repercussions that then the, the left uses forever to say, oh, look, Look what happened the last time you elected whatever you're going to call Trump. I mean, obviously, he's not like a normal Republican. But look at the last time you elected somebody like that, and they destroyed the economy. This happens all the time in Latin America, where the left screws the economy. They elect some guy who's like moderately, fiscally uh, good and conservative, I suppose, in the in kind of the generic sense. And But then, of course, trying to... Uh, fix an economy often leads to a short-term recession, uh, a, obviously a collapse in demand as uh, people who work for the government lose their jobs and the people who make a living off government job spending and all of that stuff. It, it causes a lot of economic problems. This happens again and again. And then the left comes back and says, oh, look, you elected that guy who was supposed to fix the economy and everybody just got worse off because... There always has to be a period of retrenchment that involves a lot of unpleasantness. Sometimes it even involves inflation as government uh, price controls are, are taken off the books and that sort of thing. And we see that actually at work right now in Argentina where there's been some inflation in some places and of course people are losing their jobs and there's decline in economic growth in other areas. 
And it's, of course, too early to to know how that's going to turn out in Argentina, even though it's been, uh, I don't know, uh, nine months. Uh, and so it can take much longer than that. It, the only way you can really fix the current situation in the economy, which is just now based on nonstop easy money. And this has been to a lesser extent the case since the Greens Greenspan put came in in the late 1980s. But it really accelerated after 2003 when Greenspan basically explicitly said, oh, we'll get the economy going by blowing up a housing bubble. And then there was a housing bubble. And then uh, after that, there was, of course, the global financial crisis and the, the housing crisis and all of that. And then all it just everything, all the wheels came off and the Fed just doubled down on just printing money, creating uh, monetary inflation always and everywhere, buying up huge amounts of mortgage-backed securities and all of that. And that was never reversed. None of those policies were ever taken off the books. Now, I, was, I worked in housing at the time as a housing economist, and I remember going to meetings at, at the Federal Reserve and them talking about, oh, we're going to unwind all of this. We're going to get rid of everything on our, asset, uh, on our books. We're going to uh, we're going to let interest rates go back up, and we're going to we're going to reduce our balance sheet. That never ever happened. And then it got way way worse under COVID. So now what we've got is this mega bubble economy with all sorts of different bubbles. And of course, oh, you can't say there's a bubble. Of course, there's a bubble because there's huge amounts of money that uh, has been created and is propping up asset prices. If you do, if you think there's no bubble, then you will have no problem with the Fed just selling overnight all of their uh, government bonds and all of their mortgage-backed securities. If you truly think there's no bubble, then the market will just eat up all of that. I, oh, hey, I won't even make you sell all that stuff overnight. Let's do it over 90 days. Let's just sell off all the Fed's assets over 90 days. But since there's no bubble, the market will just we'll just eat all that up, right? We'll just buy it all up, right? Of course they're not going to say that. They know that there's not enough demand out there for either government debt or for mortgages. So they don't want that to happen. And so that's just going to keep the bubble going. That's just going to prevent any sort of return to sound money, to reasonable money. And it's just going to have this baked in inflationary situation with these huge asset prices, unaffordable housing, um, and where even a small uptick in interest rates uh, sends a lot of people into bankruptcy because we've, of course, been seeing uh, huge new surges in bankruptcy over the last year. The only way you can deal with all that to return it to a somewhat normal economy is a huge deleveraging event. And that requires a lot of people going bankrupt, a lot of businesses going out of business, a lot of those maladjustments being liquidated and going into areas of the economy where there's an actual need for the investment and for the, the products and services that could be produced, not products and services that were produced in response to government created money. That's gonna, so that deleveraging, that's gonna mean unemployment. It's gonna mean people going out of business. Now, if Trump was smart, he would start that like immediately on day one. So that by the time uh, he came, by the time, well, he's not gonna come up for, for re-election. It was a very interesting situation that we, we, we don't have to worry about re-election for this guy. Um, so that by the time 2028 comes around, uh, the economy has maybe regained its footing. This is what Reagan tried to do, right? And that actually, and was pretty good at it. It's pretty successful at it. it was, all right, let's tank the economy now to deal with inflation. And we'll just hope that everything fixes itself by 84. And it worked out for him. So Trump should really try a similar strategy. And, and to be fair, uh, you know, there's some very interesting comments that Elon Musk made, um, you know, very candid comments about how, um, you know, talking about, you know, spinning cup plans, things like that, you know, acknowledging the fact that you know, in the short term, doing what is necessary to get a more sustainable path in the future is going to require economic hardship. And yeah, I, th I think it's a little different when Elon Musk says it. And obviously, you know, Trump would not have kind of used those words, particularly during a campaign. And and I, I think that's one of the interesting things. And if, if we're you know looking for um, potential opportunities, because we we are in uncharted waters. This is a very unique political moment. I mean, this is you know one of the craziest political stories in American history, and it is worth you know appreciating that in the context of things. This is not a, a status quo sort of dynamic in the short term. And the question will be, is it in the long term a status quo moment of continued decline? And so it's going to be, you know, what, given that personnel is policy, given that we know that, you know, Trump, you know, himself is not going to be some sort of wonkish micromanager, is, you know, where does, you know, this administration look at, you know, who do they bring in to 
have some outline of where things need to go. Is it going to be your traditional uh, conservative policy wonks that more or less kind of ran the ship in the first time around? There's reasons to, reasons to think that. Is it going to be more of these sort of outsider Elon Musk types? You know, J.D. Vance himself kind of embodies uh, the, this sort of, of interesting contradiction in some ways, because on one side, though he does not come from, well, I guess in, in, in some ways, right, you know, early on, he was kind of a, a you know, from forum, traditional conservative, if you will. Intellectually, um, these days, he has more, um, he dabbles more with uh, uh, the Orrin Cass crowd and, and kind of this, this uh, you know, economic nationalism sort of environment in certain ways that are you know, willing to accept bigger government, right, or, or, or more intrigued by, uh, more explicit, let's say, because we always know that any sort of rhetoric out there that we got from, you know, say, Bush-era conservatism, right, about the you know, free enterprise and limited government, all that sort of, sort of stuff was always BS, but more overt about, um, you know, kind of taking the administrative state, taking sort of the, the big government policies and trying to make them more conservative, right? There's, a, there's an intellectual trend that has been um, at least trying to interject themselves more into policy conversations um, that, that J.D. Vance has, has talked to. But on the other side, he comes from, he's got a lot of exposure to the more disruptive Silicon Valley crowd, you know, people like the Vivek Ramaswamy's and the like, you know, people like the Elon Musk's and, and all of that. And so it's going to be, you know, what of those influences are going to actually end up shaping, you know, where they end up investing this political capital? And again, looking on the track record here, the expectation should be that, but you know, is is there an actually willingness to to do the hard decisions, except that there's going to be that bust in the short term? And, and of course, you know, even though Trump doesn't run for re-election, we get to talk about midterms in two years because this political circus never ends. Um, but that is, you know, there are, at the very least, um, you know, it's it's interesting that there are at least some in that orbit that can recognize and talk about those hard truths. But the response to that, right? It's it's one thing to talk about in theory. It's another thing, you know, how how would the the public respond to it? We already know that there's going to be an incredible amount of institutional backlash to anything of significance. Um, and so again, it's it's a very very different environment. Again, there's the possibility up, upside of possibilities that would not have been thinkable from a, a traditional sort of, of political outcome. Um, but, you know, it, it is a very, very difficult path that, again, given the, un the, 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 the troubling incentives that modern American politics creates in these sort of things, um, there, there's, there's a, a lot of work to be done there. Yeah, and really, it, he's got to get off this, this thing he was doing in his first term, which was um, antagonizing Jerome Powell in an attempt to get him to keep interest rates low. Um, <laughs> I mean, Trump started out well when he was a candidate in 2016. He was criticizing the central bank. And then as soon as he came on board, he wanted uh, full-blown monetary inflation all the time to keep the economy uh, humming, as Trump saw it. And you actually did see a lot of economic growth during that period, it was the end phase of a, of a very tepid expansion that had happened since about 2012. If you remember back, the economy was very weak from 2009 through 2012, uh, hardly any real growth there at all, just enough for Obama to get reelected. And we could still, we looked at a lot of the stats in 2016, and, and the economy was still just then recovering uh, to where it had been back in 2008 in many cases. And then they, uh, even though uh, the economy had, had generally recovered and the Fed should have allowed interest rates to rise significantly, it still didn't. And part of that, I think, was due to uh, pressure from Trump to keep interest rates low, to keep the economy going based on these Fed-created bubbles. And the, if he's just going to do that again, um, as the yield curve presently shows, it's just not clear that the Fed is in control of the situation like they would prefer to be. And so Trump had just has the wrong idea if he thinks he can do a repeat of 2016 to 2020. And also, I think a lot of his supporters have just a really um, fantasy-laden idea of what of what can be done to improve the economy with things like tariffs. There has never been evidence that raising taxes uh, improves the economy. 
And even though, of course, you will meet all these pro-tariff people who insist that, oh, yes, well, tariffs were high in the 19th century, so therefore it's good for the economy. Uh, yes, the 19th century, when there was basically no federal regulatory state, when there was no income tax, and uh, the U.S. was in the midst of a huge economic expansion because of rapid industrialization, and uh, that was unregulated. So tell you what, gang, you abolish the federal regulatory state and abolish the income tax, get all that signed and in place, and then let's talk about raising uh, tariffs to those 19th century levels. Hey, that could work. That could be an improvement over the status quo. But if you just want to raise tariffs to high levels on top of the federal regulatory state, on top of the income tax, which we know you're not going to get rid of first, the, the, there's no reason to believe that's going to improve the economy. If anything, it's going to tank it because all you've done is raise taxes. Uh, but you'll hear people who are Trump supporters who think that's going to somehow get the economy humming again. And there is no reason to believe that. No historical evidence to support that idea whatsoever. And there's, there's no way around it. They, they're simply not going to be able to avoid the realities of printing $6 trillion during COVID and hoping that everything just turns out fine, even as federal deficits continue to head toward 30 trillion, you're gonna have to pay more and more debt on that. You've got the BRIC situation going on internationally, which slowly but surely will chip away at the dominance of the dollar and global demand for the dollar. I'm not saying it's gonna happen by next week, but these are trends that will continue to uh, chip away at the dollar, which will increase domestic inflation uh, potentially. So these are all things that, that Trump should not be so absurd as to think that, well, just, creating a trade war with the Chinese is going to fix all that um, because there is no reason to think that is going to work. He's got to, he's just going to have to come up with a plan to deal with the monetary inflation and, and do something about the last 25 or 30 years of monetary policy that has created our current uh, stagnation and ongoing uh, levels of price inflation that are, that continue to turn up either in assets or in consumer prices. Because, oh, wow, the CPI went back down to 3%-ish. Great. Okay. But uh, what was it? That, uh, <laughs> let's have a look at home prices to see how affordable uh, things are. Oh, right. It turns out there's still trillions of dollars churning around in that market. And normal people simply can't afford to buy houses. And that's a product of monetary inflation. This is something that's not picked up at CPI. But this is the reality. And it doesn't have to be that way. It is possible to have an economy where people can afford these assets, but we've chosen to pursue econ an economy of monetary inflation that favors the wealthy and those who already own large amounts of assets. And unless Trump does something about that, he's not fundamentally addressing any of the economic problems. Or we have an economy that's structured to benefit particularly older generations at the expense of younger generations. And that, that intergenerational divide, which when it comes to politics in particular, we, we know which side uh, votes in far greater numbers than the other, because once again, the, the incentives here are to make sure that, you know, sort of the necessary pricing corrections when it comes to housing, when it comes to uh, you know, housing in particular, but, but a variety of, you know, on, on top of that, you know, just the, the, the burdens of entitlement programs, things like that, that definitely significantly skew one generation over the other. Um, again, this is, these, these are the irretractable problems that, Trump is that, that anyone is going to find themselves in, and Trump is, is no um, no exception to that. And of course, these are also global problems as well. And I think there, there's an additional element here where, um, you know, I, I think that uh, you know how America is going to have you know within the the global side of things, and it is it's going to be interesting to see, you know, are, are we going to end up seeing. Um, you know, looking at, uh, say, the Canadian political system right now, where it looks like Trudeau is going to be on his way out sooner rather than later. We've seen um, changing tides within Europe. Is this a is there a, a larger global uh, frustration? You know, finally, finally, after the consequences, then again, you know, that that COVID over, yeah, I think revealed this this large, large buildup, this this global debt bu uh, a bubble that has been going on for, you know, particularly after 08, obviously trends prior to that, um, these sort of socioeconomic tensions 
that come with this massive financialization are a global phenomenon. We've seen Europe double down on regulation, double down on making the problem worse. Um, so that will create, you know, that, that has the potential of creating, a, to a certain extent, a competitive advantage on the regulatory side, on energy policy and things like that. So there, there's, there's things that can be done in the short term to help some of these problems. But again, that's not going to, un that, that doesn't change uh, the, the far more structural problems. And, and, and the other side of it is that, you know, at one point, uh, 2016, I know there was all this hand-wringing about uh, Trump talking about uh, kind of managed default and, and kind of dealing with the national debt um, in, in very unorthodox ways. You know, if, if that's on the table, right, if, if, you know, we've got four years, he's a, you know, very interesting dynamic there. He doesn't be concerned about a re-election while still having a, a very strong uh, electoral mandate here. If he wants to go radical on this sort of stuff, if, 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 if he even entertains that, then you know, there's still going to be, you know, that, that's not going to make interest rates go down, right? And that's something that, that you know, that's been part of his rhetorical sh uh, shtick the entire ta time is, oh, well, you know, I was in charge, interest rates were low. Again, that environment, <laughs> that environment's not coming back no matter if we you know, drill baby drill and even if we perform better than Europe on regulatory policy and, and that, this, that, and the other. That, that world, that, uh, yeah, that, that, that easy money environment is not going to come back. And that's, again, it's, it's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's got himself uh, in, a, in a very, very interesting situation right now. Well, and I think expectations are high for him, too. I think what drove a lot of these votes yes. in the old blue wall place, why do we even still call it that? Um, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, a lot more tr Trump support there than, uh, than the New York Times was willing to admit. And this was true in 2016, too, is that a lot of those places around the Great Lakes, uh, the old Rust Belt sort of places, had just not really done very well in the decade after 2008. And you could see that when you looked at, I did an article on this back then in 20, 2017, was looking at the GDP growth of these states uh, in the old Rust Belt, and they weren't doing nearly as well as a lot of these states that voted for Hillary in that year. So there was... There was a, a economic uh, dissatisfaction in those places, and that was driving a lot of the votes. So I think there's a lot of hope in a lot of these states that Trump will do something about the economy, because in spite of all of the columns writ written by wealthy East Coast economists about how the economy is spectacular, Mark Zandi writing in October that uh, the economy is the, quote, the prettiest picture you could imagine for an economy. I mean, they're saying this stuff. And it's so obvious from the election that people don't believe that and that people are suffering and that uh, price inflation, just because it's backed off a little bit recently, everybody knows that they're paying a lot more for things that they were just three years ago. And so how is he going to address that? He's, there's going to be, he's going to be expected to do something about that. And if unemployment just goes up, and remember the October report that we just got on employment was very bad, that it was the worst we'd seen in a long, long time, and it actually had private sector job growth go down. And the only thing keeping uh, overall job growth above zero was, um, was government jobs. So... You start cutting those government jobs too, and you don't replace them with private jobs. You get you get a bunch of you get a bunch of bad employment reports. Uh, your enemies start playing up on that, and then people, of course, start to feel that in the real economy. Well, so the trends are already down, and the expectations are already high that he's going to do something. So politically, that's a significant problem, and I just don't know if anyone in the administration has either the knowledge or the guts to do what really has to be done. But I guess we'll see. Right, because I mean, if, if you look at, you know, what is Trump's large political ramification, it is the reorientation of the Republican Party into the, the broad coalition of the middle class, working class Americans. And the problem is, is that, you know, we see time and time again, you know, the sort of people, and Republicans are particularly bad about this, is that Republicans win elections and the people that win them their, their elections, the people that actually, you know, kind of make up the largest percentage of their voting demographic don't get nearly as much benefit from the policies that come from that administration than, you know, than, than, the, than, the, than the elite, you know, than, uh, you know, the, the, that whole populist divide, which gave, you know, which created this moment that Trump was able to, to get control for the last, uh, you know, it's going to, you know, we're going to be looking at uh, 
you know, 12 years essentially of Trumpism controlling the Republican Party. How does that translate in, into to real policy? And I, I think, again, the more that, um, you know, I think that's one of the interesting aspects of Trump's proposals is, is that you know, he's been big on tax loopholes, essentially, rather than kind of traditional tax reforms. That's where you get the, the no tax on tips, where you get the, the no tax on um, Social Security, get the no tax on overtime, um, you know, things like that. And again, all these can create, you know, kind of interesting little windows. They, they can, it can short term can provide, I think, kind of min- uh, meaningful um, advantages, min- min- meaningful improvements in the short term on, on, the, on the kind of the, the micro scale on these sort of things. Um, but again, when it comes to buying your house, that's not gonna, and, I, and, I, and I, that, that is one of the driving issues. Again, talking, talking to normal people, the, the sort of the, the low propensity voter, um, that was a big story of this election cycle. One of the top things, particularly if they're under the age of 40, and particularly if they don't have a house, that is one of the first things that people talk about. And again, we've got this, you know, he's inheriting a situation where there is not an easy switch there um, to make that problem go away. And um, well, we'll see where we go. Yeah. Well, we'll know a lot more uh, in just a few months. Um, but if you had to guess, uh, this is the part of the show where we do predictions. <laughs> what would you predict is his, be his first economic policy? Like, what, I mean, we've talked about he's not going to try a lot of the more difficult stuff, but he's going to have to do something. So what's he gonna what's he gonna try? Is it gonna be actual legislation, or is it just gonna be a lot of toying around with the executive branch and infl- uh, um, tariff stuff? Well, part of that I think is you know we'll we'll still see the the makeup of the other branches, right? You know, a, a 51, 49 Senate will be very different in terms of um, uh, what can be you know how how ambitious they can be. Uh, you, particularly when it comes to tax policy, we don't have that sort of burden there. So I, I, what I expect is would be something similar to what we saw the first time around will be, you know, a whole lot of nonstop action with executive order early, early on, and then trying to backfill it with legislative policies going forward. Um, you know, the problem is, is that, you know, the, one of the biggest issues that Trump had first time around was having Paul Ryan as uh, Speaker of the House. That was a very clear and obvious mistake and kind of a way that a lot of the personnel policies went the first time around. I um, mean, you know, is, is Mike Johnson going to be better than Paul Ryan? I mean, based on the last, you know, however long he's been in office, being in, the, in the, the speaker's position, I have no reason to, to see a very aggressive agenda there. So I have a feeling a lot of the burden is going to be via executive order, things that can be overturned. Um, and we'll, we'll see how serious he really is about, you know, cutting waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, and again, it's always an easy, it's an, it's an easy bumper sticker, always easier said than done. Um, so and if, if there's... I think we'll see a lot of executive orders early on on some of the priority issues. We'll see how trade negotiations negotiations go. I think there's going to be a very interesting short-term dynamic of Trump essentially setting foreign policy while from Mar-a-Lago until he takes office. And I think there's some you know, should not be. You know, I think those are some some for net positives definitely um, in terms of what can happen on that side of things. But you know, how how quickly does that tariff stick come out is uh, going to be one of the things I'm watching. And again, just how active, how serious is the rhetoric about uh, cutting government from the, you know, without a legislature that has the same incentives that Trump does. Um, but I, I, I think there'll be a lot of action, whether or not it, it deals with anything uh, structural, you know, a little, little more cynical on how, uh, how that's going to play out. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap up with that then for this episode of Radio Rothbard. We'll be back next week with more, so we'll see you next time. 